Well, I think there are a number of different ways of doing it. I mean, I'd start with the analysis we talked about, which is just so the leaders understand these scores are not just nice to improve. Here is the financial benefit. Now, I have clients that will actually go a step further. If you know the value of a point of NPS, what you can begin to do is to estimate for every project that you propose the impact to the organization. So if you know that you have a problem and you've done a good analysis and you understand it, it affects this many customers, X number of customers, and it affects and it, it, it impacts NPS by Y points, right? So now you've got number of customers and number of points and you know the value of a point of NPS, you can actually begin to calculate. You can, you can rack and stack different projects against each other. So one of the classic challenges is, right, you've got those problems that affect very few people but are really significant, right, to those folks. And you've got problems that affect many people but are kind of a minor annoyance. And the question always is, which should we solve? Welcome to the Delighted Customers Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Mark Slayton, and I empower clients to turn indifferent customers into loyal fans. I help my clients achieve business outcomes by designing and delivering superior customer experiences. Hey, if you're new to the show, this is where we share practical tips, actionable insights, and the CX secret sauce to empower leaders to delight their customers. If after listening to today's show, you would like to learn more about how I can help you achieve your goals, visit my website at empoweredcx.com. Well, today on the show, I have a very special guest, Augie Ray, who has quite a long number of years experience in the world of customer experience. He is a thought leader. He is a speaker. And he has been at some amazing brands. He's been at USAA, Prudential Financial, American Express, most recently Gartner. He's got a CX blog um, that has over 2.3 million, that's right, million views. Uh, Very popular. And Augie, let me welcome you to the show. Thank you, Mark. I think you just did a nice job of calling me old since you said I had so much experience. (laughs) Well, it takes one to know one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but let we i like to use the word seasoned he's a much better word yeah yeah and you're coming to us today all the way from dublin right correct yep i've been in dublin ireland for almost two years for gartner although i will be returning back to the states repatriating as the word is uh, back to the states here in the next month or so all right well if you would uh share with with our audience how you landed in the world of customer experience and and exactly what it is you're doing now at gartner sure so let's start with what i do at gartner and then work our way back really quickly but uh, i'm currently a vp and analyst covering customer experience which means i conduct research and do advisory sessions with clients on whatever customer experience topics they may wish to discuss everything from Uh, some of the basics of personas and customer journeys up to voice of customer strategy, CX strategy, the ROI of CX, how to prove that to leaders. So um, I find it to be a particularly rewarding job. Um, How I got here, and I won't make it a long story, but I think it's interesting because I feel like I've long uh, really wanted to focus on this thing called customer experience before we were calling it CX. Um, Decades ago, I read In Search of Excellence, got really inspired and left Mm. uh, an employer where I was working that I was not convinced was very customer oriented and went to a financial services company, Northwestern Mutual, that I thought really was. Uh, But of course, CX wasn't a term that people used back then. Um, And when the internet then came, I I really saw this remarkable opportunity and got very excited about the changes it was going to bring to the way that brands worked with people and the way that that it empowered people. And I, so I threw myself into it very early, creating websites in 1995, um, working at a digital agency in like 97, 98. But I was really disappointed because marketers got a hold of the internet and it became about email marketing and banner advertising. And you know, I was much more interested in the experience, right? How did it change the way 
brands and people work together. So anyways, I've, I've sort of been following this course, I think, of really focusing on experience. And I went to a, a digital marketing agency and eventually I got to lead the experiential marketing group where we really focused on what can we do to create marketing that would be welcome rather than intrusive to people and that could, would create that better experience. Um, now I get to really focus on CX seriously at Gartner and talk to clients about what it takes to be customer centric. But uh, I feel like I've had this career that's been moving in this direction for decades, even before we knew CX as CX. Yeah, uh, and nobody seems to take the same path getting into the world of customer experience. And yours is interesting, uh, especially the brands that you you work for, uh, all very storied brands in particular. And um, you know, some people may not be who are listening may not be familiar with Gartner. I was very familiar. We use Gartner for a variety of things on the CIO uh, folks use them and we had a contract with them. But just at a high level, can you tell us like sure. what Gartner brings to organizations? <laughs> So Gartner uh, primarily focuses on IT leaders, but we also have divisions focused on HR leaders, marketing leaders, which I'm in supply chain leaders. And what we do is we conduct research on best practices and publish this research, which of course we hope will be broadly interesting to many people and help them to do their jobs better to, to empower them, right? Um, at the same time, we recognize that as we write research to everybody, that there's going to be very unique circumstances that every client faces, decentralized versus decentralized, B2B versus B2C, right? Different challenges. And so we offer advisory services with the people who conduct the research, people like me. Um, and for 30 or 45 minutes, you can share your documents. You can talk about the challenges you can, you're can you having. You can talk about the roadblocks you're facing. Uh, we'll review uh, strategies and talk about some of the traps that you might avoid. And so what we try to do is through a series of advisory sessions, help clients as they execute whatever they wish. And in my world, it happens to be customer experience. Well, great. Th thanks for uh, sharing that. And then when you just to follow up on the word customer experience, you know, it's it means different things to different organizations. And one of the terms that goes along with that, like one of the goals, I guess, that organizations say they want to be is customer centric. We want to be a customer centric organization. Can you explain what it means for an organization to truly be customer centric and, and what makes it so difficult? Well, so when we talk about being customer centric, we really are urging our clients to be truly customer centric. And what we mean by that is really focusing on the benefits to the customer and knowing that when you deliver benefits to the customer, that you then get the value of stronger relationships, right? Um, and so one of the challenges that we face, we talk a lot about the ROI of CX, is that uh, CX leaders will you know, set out in a very customer centric direction. They want to listen to customers. They want to improve customers' lives. But then leaders start asking, well, what is the ROI of this? Why should I improve my net promoter score NPS? Why should I improve CSAT? Um, you know, what's I, I have many people asking for budget. Many people uh, have proposals that will save us money and increase our margins. Some people have proposals for increasing acquisition, which will increase our sales. And you say, you know, you're coming to me to, to simply improve satisfaction. What is that worth? And so what will happen is so many CX leaders then begin to shift to, well, if we execute this program, it'll save us money. If we execute this program, we'll get more sales. And what they end up doing is not being at all customer centric. Now they're not doing things to improve the lives of the customer, to, to be customer centric. And so when we talk about being customer centric, it's really about measuring impact to customer, knowing what matters to customers, um, having metrics within the organization to balance those short-term financial measures against the leading measures of customer relationship strength that we know are so important, um, and ultimately being able to show the relationship between the two. Um, so to give you a, a, an example, American Express, one of the things we would do is we, we tended to focus on net promoter score. We would do an analysis that would show what the value of every point of net promoter score was to the organization. That as net promoter score rose, here was the value that we got from our clients, our customers, so that it wasn't just an exercise in being nice to the customer or feeling you know more committed to the customer, that we were in fact improving things for the customer because we knew it would deliver financial results to our organization. Got it. 
Got it. And so, so um, I think about um, USAA and what an incredible brand they have. And when we, when we at the bank I worked at, we shared with the newcomers to the organization some of the best brands and some of the and the way we described it was Net Promoter Score, uh, mm -hmm. one of the ways. And USAA was always at the very top of that. Now, granted, they have a very um, I don't know harm. Um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Their 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 constituency is very loyal based on the fact that they're military, right? You have to be either a, a current or or former or family member of a military to be a member there. So there's a unique, but still there were some specific things that they were able to accomplish. I don't write it off. I pe people have written it off just because of that audience that they serve yeah, but i don't i think they had to do some very specific things what are some of the things from your vantage point since you worked there yeah i, I loved working there and could certainly uh, talk a great deal about the wonderful experiences i had uh, as a leader at, at usaa but um what i would say is that i do think people are very quick to write off that because it's a military focused organization as you say that they get more loyalty i don't i, I think that's partially true but, you know, there are lots of organizations trying to focus on military members, right? Um, I think that uh, USAA has success for a whole slew of reasons, one of which is they're a full service financial service provider. I mean, lots of, as you know, lots of financial services organizations say they want to be the, you know, the financial partner for their customers, but then they don't have these key components. And so one of the things that USAA has is not just do they have life insurance and offer mortgages and credit cards and retirement, but they've also then got the checking, they've got the auto insurance, they've got savings. And so they can really be sort of that uh, cradle to grave financial partner. And that's really their mission and, and, and something they take very seriously. Another thing that I saw as an example is that they tend to overstaff their call centers compared to a lot of organizations. Very committed to um, not just to answering quickly, which of course, you know, everyone appreciates, but the prototypical experience of talking to somebody at USAA is somebody who takes time and has patience and cares about, you know, your financial uh, well-being. Um, one of the, the sort of prototypical experiences that we get shared in the organization is somebody who would call up and you know need to change their address or something. And the person on the other end of the line, not just changing their address and rushing off so they can get to the next call would say, hey, I hear a, an infant in the background. I don't see that you've got any children listed. You know, do you, has there been a change in your life? Well, yes, there has. Well, you know, would you like to get them added to your life insurance? Have you considered a savings account for them? Um, and obviously that, that can come off as salesy, but it really is dedicated to uh, listening to and being there for the needs of, 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 their, of their members, as they call them. Um, and again, I could certainly go on. I, one of my favorite stories is to talk about the onboarding that I went through, um, which, you know, for a lot of organizations, they have no onboarding or it's, you know, two hours. And when I joined USAA, it was a four day session that everyone had to attend. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you this, honestly, I actually had tears in my eyes every single day, um, listening to, you know, what family members go through, listening to what veterans go through. They had a wonderful persona exercise of putting new employees in the shoes of somebody who serves and thinking about going overseas into a very dangerous part of the world, leaving your family behind. And how do you provide for them, not just their financial well-being, which is what USAA is all about, of course, but you know, also the other things, you know, the, you tend to think about, you know, their, their mental health and whatnot. And so um, by the end of those four days, I have to tell you, I was just super enthused about just getting out of the training room and doing my best because the members deserved it. And that was the general sense of everyone in that room. And so there are a lot of moving pieces to why USAA is so successful. It certainly goes well beyond that they focus only on the military community. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the the idea of new hire orientation uh, and onboarding because I think that's a critical moment, moment of truth, moment that matters for employees. And it really, if you say you're customer centric, we were just talking about customer centricity, <laughs> and you bring people on and you don't even talk about the customer experience. Well, are you really, are you really living the principles? 
Yeah, that most organizations don't, you know, they really, I, I fully agree with you. I think onboarding is something that in the employee experience gets overlooked too much. I mean, you've got somebody who's new, um, you hopefully, I, I would hope, want something different or more from them than, than they gave or was expected at their last employer. And USAA makes that really clear. You know, they tell you why you need to give the best for these people and why it's worth it. Um, another thing USAA did, again, a high value thing is um, they would have actual members, again, their customers, uh, come in and speak when they had uh, all employee sessions. Um, and so someone would get up and talk for five minutes about what it was like that USAA was a part of their family and the ways that USAA had helped improve their lives. And then we get on to, you know, the other stuff in an all employee meeting, the business stuff, but you were always being reminded of the impact that uh, our organization, that, that you, you know, as an employee had on the members of USAA. Yeah. Well, let, let's um, it just such an interesting topic. Let's shift gears a little bit because you also mentioned the ROI of CX. And, uh, and for those uh, people who are not quite as familiar with our world, um, you know, CX leaders have often been, uh, I don't know, the, the word is kind of on the outside looking in, uh, trying to make, uh, make ground in a world of competing priorities. But you know, there's, there's, if you look across organizations, and part of the reason I'm serving now on the board of CXPA is because we are not uh, an automatic department in organizations or area in organizations. We're still trying to continually justify ourselves. In that light, um, proving, not just doing things, right? Like collecting survey responses, doing journey maps, setting up metrics, um, doing employee orientations. These are things that we do, but ultimately we have to, we have to prove to leadership that it's making a difference in the business outcomes that they're looking for. And yet um, I think a lot of CX leaders, to be fair, fall short in that area. What, why is do. it so, why is it so important to prove the ROI of CX? And can you share an illustration of of, of an example of one that might make an impact on senior management? Yeah, well, it's funny. We've, we've done some research on this topic, as you might imagine. Hey, I work at a research firm. Um, yeah. And so uh, uh, one of the things that we have found is that when an organization is able to show the correlation between customer satisfaction and business outcomes, they are much more likely to uh, report success as measured by the customer, more likely to report success as measured by management, and more likely to get budget for CX. And so part of the challenge, and we talked about this earlier, is we all work in organizations that have very short-term financial focuses. Even more this year, probably than in past years, right? We're in some very uncertain economic times. Um, budgets are, are under constraint. So when you are the person who walks into the leader's office and says, we want to do this because it will lift our net promoter score or our CSAT. Um, how does a leader stack that against all the things that people are coming in with hard ROIs, right? We need to do this. Our systems are breaking. Um, you know, we have, uh, we're increasing costs and can decrease costs if we do these things. And so what, what happens is that because we have not positioned it as in the way that business thinks, right, in terms of financial sense, which brings us back to it's important not to just jump over the customer and not go directly to here are projects that will save us money or here are projects that will increase our acquisition. We need to be able to think through the eyes of the customer, remain customer focused, as, as we talked about, or customer centric. Um, and so our research says, you know, it's a very, very simple way of thinking about it, right? Um, can we take the, the scores? And again, I I know there's a lot of debate about NPS out there. Let's set that aside and say, I don't care if it's NPS or CSAT or likelihood to repurchase. But the point is, these are all derived from customers, right? It is their conscious awareness of their satisfaction. I mean, these are all satisfaction questions in the end. Um, and so if we start there, we're starting with the customer. And if at a customer level, then we can begin to draw the correlation between those scores and the sales that we get after the ratings are received, the retention that we experience, uh, the cost to serve the customer, the referrals that we get. Basically, can we show that the scores aren't just scores that are nice to earn because we want to be committed to the customer, but as we improve these scores, we can demonstrate 
the, a higher lifetime value, that we are delivering margin and growth and financial success. And so if you can begin to do that, it changes the, the discussion topic. Now you want to improve NPS, not because everyone should be committed to raising NPS. I'll joke with my customers. I'm, I'm like, no one will ever in a meeting stand up and say, no, we shouldn't improve those scores. Like, you know, nobody ever does that. No one's ever going to tell you, we'll make more money if we lower that promoter score, right? Everyone sort of is going to voice their support. And what happens with CX so often is the leaders think they have support because everyone's saying the right things. We're going to be customer centric. We're going to improve those scores. And then you go for budget and you need resources and you need organizational resources. And suddenly everything dries up because you haven't been able to tell the story of impact. So anyways, as I said, our research is very clear in showing that if you can turn these customer-derived scores using analysis into the impact that those have, and there's many ways of doing that, which I probably don't want to get into too much detail here. Happy to talk a little bit more, but I did talk about that American Express would look at the scores we earned. And in the trailing 12 months after getting those scores, how much did people spend on their cards? And we could show very demonstrably that every point of NPS was worth that much spend. And so now when we talk about NPS, now we're not just doing it because we, we want to feel pride in better scores or we believe that it's good for the company. We could begin to demonstrate actual financial benefits. So um, I think that that's where CX leaders go awry is, is one of two things. They either don't show any financial benefit and they just lose support. Um, I was just today talking to my third friend who's been laid off from a CX leader job in the last two months. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it is important to show it or they skip the customer altogether and they cut, turn it to just another short-term cost savings mechanism where they're not, in fact, focused on improving the relationship with the customer in any way. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um about the CX leaders, because I just think it's the wrong move for corporations. It's we should be doubling down on CX now, right now. Well, I think that's especially funny because everybody, you know, it's strange to me every time we go through a recession and, you know, people are worried about a recession now. Um, but every time we go through a recession, uh, we learn this lesson. We learn that you should focus on your existing customers. You should keep your existing customers. That the that the brands that leave recessions are the ones that continue to invest. And yet, every recession, we end up doing exactly the same thing, which is we get very sort of focused on acquisition. And you know, while I try to poke as many holes as possible in tropes and altruisms, you know, one that is absolutely true, which you obviously well know, Mark, is that it costs a lot less to keep a customer than it does to acquire one. And so if we are, in fact, heading into recessionary times and have more economic headwinds ahead of, ahead of us, the last thing you should be doing is shutting down listening to customers and the efforts to try to improve relationships that will pay off for you a lot more than trying to chase new customers in a down economy. So, so agree with that. Um, Augie, because you have so much knowledge on this topic, I'd like to double, double tap on the ROI of CX a little bit and say, look, if, if you, if you were uh, someone who was leading an organization and in, in the customer experience world, and you were trying to make an impact with your CEO or CFO, um, mm -hmm. What what might be a, a a specific ROI approach that you might look at? Well, I think there are a number of different ways of doing it. I mean, I'd start with the analysis we talked about, which is just so the leaders understand these scores are not just nice to improve. Here is the financial benefit. Now, I have clients that will actually go a step further. If you know the value of a point of NPS, what you can begin to do is to estimate for every project that you propose the impact to the organization. So if you know that you have a problem and you've done a good analysis and you understand it, it affects this many customers, X number of customers, and it affects and it, it, it impacts NPS by Y points, right? So now you've got number of customers and number of points, and you know the value of a point of NPS, you can actually begin to calculate. You can, you can rack and stack different projects against each other. So one of the classic challenges is, right, you've got those problems that affect very few people but are really significant, right, to those folks. And you've got problems that affect many people but are kind of a minor annoyance. And the question always is, which should we solve? And if you begin to be 
able to know what the point of NPS or CSAT or effort score is, you can begin to evaluate which of these things will have the greatest financial impact without losing your customer-centric lens, right? Now, there are other ways, right? There are certainly are ways where um, I have, uh, when we were America, American Express, one of the things that I think we began to realize is that we were very good at identifying problems and encouraging action on those problems. But after action was taken, everyone would sort of pat themselves on the back and say, well, done with that, let's move on to the next problem. What we didn't do often is go back and evaluate, did we have the impact that we wanted both to the customer and to the organization? So we started doing some projects where we would go back to uh, things that had been completed six to 12 months ago. And we'd begin to look at, first of all, from the customer perspective, did we in fact lift the scores that we expected, right? Here was the scores before this change, here are the scores after. We succeeded, right? One important aspect, still not the financial aspect, we would also then begin to look at before and after. Did we, when we made a change, did we actually notice that something like retention would go up? People who had this experience before the change, here was the percentage of retention or attrition that we had. And after the change, people who then went through that same experience, what was the, the level of attrition or or not. So I think that's another way that maybe not a forward looking, but at least beginning to uh, get back in front of leaders to make sure they know that the things we're doing are having an impact, not just on our, on our voice of customer scores, but also on our business. Now, the last thing I'll just mention, which is pretty obvious, we talked to our clients about making financial benefits more of the secondary pitch. So the first pitch is we're going to do this because it's going to improve the customer's lives and strengthen their relationship with us, right? Now, one of the things we might begin to show as for ROI is also, and people who have this experience do tend to attrite, right? Or uh, some of my clients who don't have really good attrition or retention numbers, which I always think is, is kind of funny that, that, that organizations lack good definitions for that. Um, but one of the things that they might look at is uh, exit interviews in B2B world. When we lose a customer, what do they have to tell us about why they left? And so going back into our leader's offices and saying, not only are we going to improve scores, but we know from our research that this is a, a significant uh, contributor to attrition rates. Um, and so those are some of the ways that uh, we would urge our clients to think about ROI, always starting with the customer and then working your way around to maybe some of those more financial measures as well. Yeah. Re relative to MPS, I, I think um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this uh, in terms of tracking you know, the movement of a percentage of MPS as it relates to financial outcomes. Um, there are times when uh, a couple of things, some events may happen that impact it. Um, when we, when we, when COVID happened and uh, we shut down, actually initially we shut down our branches for in, uh, in person. And then we, we were a lot, we were appointment only for a while. People, people were under the misperception that the branches were, were closed for a long period of time. They aren't, weren't actually closed, but you had to make an appointment. So you had a lot of uh, stress on the system. The irony is that <clears throat> um, more people were calling into the call center to get things done. And NPS, and you know, we were just speculating, but NPS and other CSAT and all of our numbers went way up mm -hmm. during the initial part of of that. We believe it was very common across many organizations. We heard that, and I think. Uh, I think it was a combination of things. I think people had a lot of forgiveness in their hearts in the early going. Um, and I think that uh, that even though some of our experiences degraded because call centers were getting overwhelmed, uh, people understood that. They know people were trying really hard. They knew how, how hard they were working both in their lives and in their jobs to make this very rapid transition. So very common to have seen uh, VOC scores go up in uh, early 2020. And then I'm going to guess you began to see them fall again because forgiveness only gets uh, gives you so far for so long. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a great illustration. And I was going to say, um, yeah, the, the customers had some empathy for the people who were also going, showing up and going to the office or whatever. Um, on the other hand, um, so yeah, on the back end of that, maybe we could just use that as the example, forgiveness started to wane and uh, service still had not really improved or very minor improvements. Uh, and other organizations outside of our industry were 
catching up. They were getting better. And so that became the bar. Right. So, right. so um, one could, ar- what would you say to someone who would argue, let's say the C- the CX leader is saying, Hey, look, we can move MPS by a point and it would represent this. But then other people would say, well, yeah, you have these events that could uh, greatly impact that number that are outside of our control. Yeah. You're always going to have external events that are going to impact that. Um, COVID's probably a bad example because it really affected everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that uh, that uh, some of my clients will observe is that they'll look at an event that had an impact. Uh, you know, price increase is a good example, right? I'll talk to B2B clients and they'll say, well, we had a price increase, scores went down. Of course, that's going to happen. Well, yeah, probably, right? <laughs> that's not a big surprise. But what you can begin to do, and I find that a lot of organizations do not use their VOC data very well, you can begin to look at the VOC data for the people who've only had a price increase, right? Don't just say, well, its score went down. Some of those people were still happy, right? And we would do this at American Express with rate increases. Some of those people are still happy. What is it that made them happy, even though they experienced the same impact as these other people who are unhappy? Were there things that... um, that that are that we should know about them. Are there personas, for instance, that maybe are less price sensitive, or that we communicated in a certain way and it worked, while others it didn't? Um, or are there practices that we did? You know, the way we communicated the 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 uh, the, the rate increase that uh, tended to either help or harm the the score that we get. So one of the things I think we can do is begin to isolate some of the VOC data for people impacted by an event like this, and still begin to see. When it worked for people, you know, what was it that we did and what should we learn from that? And when it didn't work from people, what should we learn from that? Um, So I've had some B2B clients do a really interesting uh, job of looking at how rate increases uh, are handled. And they've done it through the lens of their VOC data by looking at people who were still happy despite a rate increase versus the people who weren't. Um, So I think there's very different ways of beginning to unpack this. I think the first thing we always have to acknowledge, though, is they're absolutely right. External events are going to have an impact on that, just like external events are going to have an impact on your sales, right? So um, these things are, in fact, true. It doesn't mean NPS or sales are not important. It just means we have to have a different way of looking at our data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, th- thanks for unpacking that. I, I think you're you're 100% right about the fact that um, there are aberrations or things that happen that are outside of our control. There are some things that like a merger and acquisition that yes, we have some control over, but we have to expect that there's going to be some impact on the customer experience. And that may, that, and, and then the goal is to really understand how can we get back? <laughs> how can we be, get back to where we should be? Well, and again, another thing that I point out, and, and one of the things I try to focus on is how I can get my clients to use data to understand impact better. Um, So one of the things that's really important to look at when we go through a giant event like COVID is, did we do a better job of retaining uh, the people who had a higher net promoter score CSAT than the people who didn't? In other words, did we earn that forgiveness? We talked earlier about forgiveness. Did we earn more forgiveness from people who were more satisfied with our set of services before the event happened. One of the reasons to have a strong relationship is in fact, not just because you can drive growth, but when those unexpected things that you can't control happen, you'll hopefully weather them better. And this gives us that opportunity to prove that. So I think there's a number of really interesting and different ways of using your data to tell that story. but you got to get out of the, well, you know, our score went down. So what are we going to do about it sort of mentality? Uh, because that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, let me let me ask you one more question. And then I want to ask you sort of a personal question, which is, we just talked about ROI. And, and, and sometimes where CX leaders don't do a good enough job, don't do any job of explaining the ROI and the connection between CX. But why, why would you say CX programs struggle? Um, I, I, I am really convinced and I, and I say this quite honestly, that it's because, uh, and I hate to, to be sound like I'm a one note, uh, CX analyst. I do lots of things. We can talk about other things, which I will in a moment, but, um, 
it's, it begins and ends with, have you demonstrated that this will have business impact? That being customer centric, that listening to customers, that strengthening relationships will have business impact. If you do, you tend to get budget, tend to get resources, you tend to get collaboration. If you don't, you, you tend to struggle. Now, that's hardly you know, the only challenge. There's, you know, organizations do a bad job of collaboration. Uh, CX succeeds more when it is cross-functional and collaborative. Um, I've made that mistake in my own career, uh, one of the places I worked, where we went through the whole exercise of understanding the customer's persona and mapping the journey and finding what was right or wrong in an end-to-end journey. And then we went around the organization saying, we've done all the heavy lifting for you. Here's what customers are telling us about your area, right? And instead of thinking, wow, this has been a great service that uh, Augie and his team have performed, what they heard was criticism. Here's what Augie's telling us we're doing wrong. And Mm. I would hear a a handful of things. First of all, we know that already. Like, you know, all that work that I just did, just told people what they already knew. Second of all, we'd hear, I disagree. You don't have all the information. We hadn't involved people. We didn't get different perspectives, right? Um, And so what was interesting is that when this happened, I went back and we threw out the work we did and we started over, essentially doing the same project, this time collaboratively, this time with partners. Let's understand the customers. Let's map the journey together. What data sources do you have? Where do you disagree? And at the end of that, now, instead of, you know, being my opinion, whether it's grounded in, in fact or not, you know, it's our uh, it's our work. We have consensus. We begin to say, you know, this is the impact that we can have and, and what the customer wants from us. So I think there's a lot around organization. Um, the last thing I'll just mention really quickly, again, based on our research, we found something really interesting, which is, We found three primary drivers of customer experience success in our last research of 18 months ago. The first one, because we were very marketing focused, is that the top driver of CX success is when marketing focuses on the end-to-end journey and not just the path to purchase. Now, that's a pretty obvious one, um, but, you know, there is that, that danger. One of the things that goes wrong in CX is that CX can begin to look like the part of the the company that you're in. So if you're marketing, you're focused on CX on the path to purchase. If you're customer care, you're focused on the CX of customer care. Um, and so the more we can begin to focus on the end and journey, not just you know our portion of it, the better. The other two top drivers, and this is where I think it gets interesting, was um, organizations that have been uh, developing and using personas for more than three years and organizations that have been developing and using customer journeys for more than three years. In other words, so often we think that we're going to get something right on the first iteration. What I think our research begins to show us is that these things take time. They take iteration. You're not going to get them right the first time. It takes a while to get personas and journey maps to be used. And it's the commitment over time to improving and getting people to use these assets that, in fact, are the drivers of CX success. So, you know, those would be all the things, but it still starts with, if I can't tell a story of why this is important to the business, shouldn't surprise me that I can't get budget and resources. Mm. All th- three really important things and insightful things and things that I think CX leaders should really think about, <clears throat> um, especially the patients involved in, in continuing on and having that commitment to saying it's not a one and done. We're just really beginning when we do that first persona, first journey map. How often have you seen personas get developed and 12 months later, nobody's using them and they're forgotten. You know, here we find that you have to be able to, to really get this into the, the muscle memory of your organization for three years before people begin to see the value. And, and maybe even before the value of those personas improves enough so that they're actually driving actions and not just looking like pretty pictures to people. Well, this has been incredibly interesting, fun, as I knew it would be. Um, I have one last question before we start to land the plane here, which is, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Uh, um, I wish I had been bolder in making changes in my career in retrospect. Um, mm-hmm. When I look back, it is the time when I was more complacent, uh, when I was uh, you know, happier with my current situation. I didn't think there was a need to, to, to think of moving on. Um, I even think of, you know, I was, I was digital and in the internet very early. I mentioned creating websites and I was doing email strategy in like 1996, 1997. So very early on. Um, but I was doing it in Milwaukee and it took me, uh, 
something like another 10 or 15 years before I made the move to San Francisco, where, you know, you feel like you're in the center of the world. I was, I was in Silicon Valley. I was in, you know, uh, in San Francisco, I was mm. meetings at Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, you begin to feel like this is the, this is the place where stuff gets done. And mm. uh, I don't say that to, you know, disparage Milwaukee or any midsize city. <laughs> I'm very eager to be moving back to Milwaukee. I want to have a really big impact on, on maybe helping uh, Milwaukee in terms of, you know, the way it approaches customer experience. Um, and because uh, I know so many great people there at the same time, I wondered if I had been a little bolder and and taken those risks that so many people do, uh, if I wouldn't have maybe uh, been had an even more interesting career. All that being said, it is so. Here, here's the thing I would tell my current self, if you don't mind me riffing just yeah, a little further, sure. which is, you know what? I've had a really good career. I'm in a very good spot. Um, who knows if I had been bolder and riskier, if I would have, you know, messed up what worked and what didn't. And so I, I sometimes think we've got to also, while we look back, maybe think about what regrets or how, what we might do different, we should remember what we have. And so one of my mottos of the last few years, since you asked a personal question, I'll get really personal here, is to focus on what I have, not what I don't have. It's really easy to get frustrated with, you know, my career should be here. I wish I was doing that. Um, but, but uh, you know, when I get there, and I do, and you know, I get frustrated like everybody else, one of the things that I think gets my head back in the game, think about what you have, not what you don't have. And so sometimes maybe we should stop talking to our 20-year-old selves and talk to our current selves about that. <laughs> there you go. That's a great, a great way to end the show. Focus on what you do have, not what on you don't, what you don't have. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great piece of advice. Um, hey, so much fun being with you. If our listeners wanted to uh, get a hold of you, reach out, what would be the best way? Well, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Uh, try to post some interesting and provocative things uh, every day if I can. So I try to be accessible on LinkedIn. I've given up Twitter. Uh, don't like the direction of its leaders and some of the things that it's doing. Uh, it was very hard. I had 23,000 followers on, on Twitter that were fairly engaged, but I gave that up some months ago. I'm on Mastodon. I would recommend uh, people consider Mastodon. I takes a little bit to get used to, operates just slightly different than Twitter, but it's a really good place. And for what it's worth to anyone listening who maybe needs a little bit of encouragement, I get much more engagement on Mastodon than I get on Twitter. The freed of the algorithm actually good content does tend to uh, deliver some audiences and engagement. So if anyone has any questions about Mastodon, you can connect on me there or over on LinkedIn and certainly happy to have those discussions. Excellent. Um, and I will add that your blogs are always very thoughtful and insightful and very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not. What's funny is I'm not doing the long form blog posts as much these days. I'm trying to focus on what I can do to make uh, LinkedIn post size uh, contributions to the dialogue. Uh, but I do appreciate that. I, I try hard to, to be thoughtful and to engage folks. Always open to criticism and feedback and suggestions. So again, if anyone out there listening wishes to tell me what they think, please let me know on LinkedIn. Augie Ray, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. This has been fun. I appreciate your time, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Delighted Customers Podcast. I'd like to ask you a favor. If you have enjoyed this episode or any of my other ones, hit subscribe or follow. I've got a lot of other great guests that are coming up and a lot of other great content, and I don't want you to miss anything. You can find any links or references on the show in the show notes, and you can find those on my website at empoweredcx.com.